welcome everybody. My name is Jeff Green. I'll be your host tonight. Thank you for joining us. I am very excited to say that Team Up for Hope has Bobby Kahn, author of In the Shadow of the Valley, a memoir, uh, present with us tonight. Welcome, Bobby. Thanks for being here with us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. We're, I've been so excited for this uh, discussion, interview, if you will. Um, I stumbled upon Bobby's book on Amazon. I'm an avid reader and I just I wanted to learn more about the Appalachian region. And uh, Bobby's book came up and it was a page turner. I couldn't put it down and I finished the book and reached out to Bobby and here we are. So um, what I want to do is I want to encourage everybody who's uh, able to is joining us live here. If you have a question, you can use the question tool to put it in and we can have Bobby answer your question directly. Um, depending on how many questions we may get them all answered, we may not get them all answered, but please just come through with them and we'll do the best that we can to make sure that they all get answered. Um, but what I want, what I'm the kind of the format for tonight is Bobby and I picked specific excerpts from the memoir that I'm going to read to you to kind of set the scene so that you really understand Bobby's life in, in essence. Um, this is a woman who I consider to be nothing short of a hero, what she has endured, what she has gone through in her early life to be where she is now uh, is just nothing short of remarkable. And the story has got to be told. And that's what we do at Team Up for Hope. We just trying to create awareness for mental illness, substance use and, and uh, suicide. And um, Bobby can really help to that end. And the, and the fact that she's still standing here on planet earth and, and able to talk with us and has written this memoir and is continuing to write is just nothing short of amazing. So stay with us. We're going to keep this contained to within an hour's time. Um, and it should be a very compelling discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to read the first excerpt for, um, from Bobby's memoir. And this is pertaining to her childhood. We're going to start in the childhood and work our way up through her later years. Poverty was the cheap meat we ate with boxed macaroni and cheese, but it was also the food my dad flung to the floor. It was the picture I found of my father's handiwork, a picture he took after he tore the kitchen faucet loose and hurled it through the kitchen window. It was the dentist appointments we never had, the coal stove spewing fine black soot onto our clothes, into our hair and our noses. It was the fire dying in the coal stove. It was my mother slammed into the coal stove. It was the ear infections that kept me from hearing every first insult, every first command. It was the electric going out during every storm, but it was also my father turning the meter upside down so it would run backward and we could pay the bill. It was the creek water we weren't supposed to drink, the same water we mixed into Kool-Aid. It was watching my dad shoot his gun at a dog by the creek, watching him whip a dog with his belt, watching him dump a dog's body in the woods. It was riding in his truck to another man's house where he left me sitting and took his rifle to the man's door. It was the truck getting repossessed and the, and the bank's men loading the truck with our trash at gunpoint before they could drive it away. It was complicated. It refuses to be defined. In my childhood fairy tale world, my father was misunderstood. Not even he understood himself like I did. I hurt for him, his pain, the oppression of living poor and being a man who felt too small. I grew up in fear of this man I loved, ready to forget his trans transgressions in an instant. There were so many. It seems he killed the part of himself that might have claimed the redemption. I waited for the moment when he would wake up and realize that it was all a bad dream, that my father loved us and was there to protect us, that my mom was strong and worthy of his adoration. We would share a laugh at the odd dream that seemed so real and then go about being our true selves selves that smiled because we weren't afraid and our teeth weren't rotting and no one would whip you because they thought maybe you were mocking them. One morning while we were eating breakfast, Junior and I heard screams from outside. We jumped up from the kitchen table and went to the back door where we stared through the screen. Our father had our mother's hair in one hand and he was using it to pull her down the road towards Granny's house. They were at least to the first post of Granny's fence that marked the boundary and kept her cows in. We watched as he used his other fist to hit our mother over and over on her head, face, whatever he could to do, whatever he could to get to. It was mostly her screams that we were hearing, though his were mixed in too. For some reason, far away as they were, he suddenly noticed us, Then he didn't, though he didn't stop dragging her. 
So that's one excerpt from the book, Bobby. And there are many, many such stories in there. And, you know, for a kid like myself who, you know, growing up, I always felt like I kind of had it hard because my father and my mother were divorced and this, that, the other thing, you know, pales in comparison to what you endured. And, and I know that everybody's situation is difficult for themselves, but I guess now hearing me read this, like, how does it, how does that, what does it drop? What, what, what emotions are conjured for you as I read, read that? It actually surprised me um, that it definitely evoked some sadness to hear you read it. I've read it, you know, out loud quite a few times myself and, you know, narrated the audio book. So I've worked on it and worked on it, but um, yeah, hearing someone else read it, I just could see my little girl's self and maybe because I'm not focused so much on getting the words right and, you know, following the sentence. So I'm not having to use my logical brain when I'm listening. I could just be in the scene and in the emotion of it. And yeah, I mean, it's still, there's just a lot of sorrow there. You know, it was a very chaotic and um, anxiety inducing childhood, I would say. Yeah, I mean, there was clearly a lot of physical, mental, and emotional abuse going on in that household. And, um, you know, obviously your father was at the epicenter of it, you know, and, and kind of um, the person causing a lot of it. Um, is he still around? Yeah, um, he still lives, you know, close to where I grew up. Um, and we, we haven't been in touch for a few years now, just because it's one of those things where um, I feel like keeping keeping a distance is really important because his his need for whatever his need is, uh, it, it still manifests in kind of a very taking personality. Mm. Um, and so for me, it's still as his child, it's really hard to draw the boundary constantly, you know, to like push, push away the adult who needs so much. Mm, mm. Most recently that looked like him asking me for money and asking me to um, take care of things for him while he was in jail. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, I, I, I just had to stop responding because I'd, you know, I actually bought my grandparents' house from him mm. um, a couple of years ago, uh, Granny's house that yeah. figures so prominently in the book. Mm. And, um, you know, once I had paid off a little bit of uh, the debt that I incurred with that um, because of the way we structured it, mm -hmm. then you know, I just, he just kept wanting more and more money. Mm. And I eventually was like, I, I can't take care of you. You know, I have to mm. take care of my family yeah. and my children. So. Mm. Yeah. And I, that house, it's interesting that you mentioned this. This is, you know, something I just learned right now that you bought granny's house, which is such a central place. And it's like, it's a safe haven for you there, you know, within the book. And it's like, as the reader, you know, I, I would, I would like when you got there because it was like, oh my God, she's safe there. You know, it's like, you just don't know what's going to happen next. And um, so it's amazing that it was actually still within the family, like title was still owned by somebody to, to this point to be able to hang on to it. Right. Because it just seemed, everything just seemed so turbulent, you know? Yeah, that was a really interesting experience. Um, and I, I wrote an essay about it which is on my website, because when I bought it, um, my dad had been living in it after my grandpa passed away. So my dad had probably been there for eight years or so. Um, and it was an older house. Part of it was built in the 20s, part in the 50s, I believe. And, you know, it just hadn't been kept up. Um, so there were structural issues but I 
I actually spent a lot of time and, you know, invested money cleaning it up. Yeah, sure. Um, hauled off mini trucks of garbage and, mm. um, you know, stripped out soiled carpet, pumped mm. the septic tank, did all sorts of things. And in the end, it was not habitable still. Mm. Um, just because it had been neglected for so long. So long, yeah. But it, it felt like a very transformative experience still mm. to kind of like deal with this one last very tangible mess that was, you know, the culmination of all these years of drug abuse and neglect and, um, you know, being mentally unwell and poverty all just, combined together so it was a really interesting experience and I'm, I'm glad I got to do it and like mm. say goodbye to the house on my terms mm. Mm. yeah that's that's a nice story so the so granny and granny's house to me was one way that you survived childhood just mentally survived you know right but mm -hmm. I I've been wanting to ask this question like how do you like knowing what you went through now it's almost a miracle. Wouldn't you agree that like you've made it to where you are today? And, and I'm, you, you see yourself in your own children and you would never want them to experience what you did, right? Or go through that. But it's like, how did you survive it? Like, how did you survive? I mean, there was, you know, heavy drugs being used right there in front of you as a kid. I mean, every everything that could happen did happen and you made it through. So like, how did you, how did you survive? How did you do it? You know, I, I think I had a couple of lifelines. Um, one being the the connection I felt with Granny. Um, you know, she always would tell me that I was special, and so I felt like even though I, I didn't feel seen or understood or valued most of the time, I felt like um, she did value me. You know, she wasn't a particularly warm and affectionate person so it wasn't like kind of your stereotypical grandmother um, um, stereotype but it was it felt very deep and true and you know even as a child that registered with me as being special and important and then I was also fortunate to grow up in Appalachia and to be out in the woods mm. and so you know, when I was running from the chaos in our home, I was running into the arms of the forest where, you know, there was just natural beauty and the peace and stillness that comes with nature and, you know, the, the little miracles that are all around us in nature and that just the beauty, the depth of that beauty, I think, was also constantly impressing upon me that there's something more than the pain that I might be in at that moment. And, you know, finally, I think what you said about it being a miracle that I survived, um, you know, I, I do think it was, it feels like my spiritual purpose in life was to go through those experiences and to have that kind of background but to be given the ability and the opportunities that I've worked for to, um, to be able to tell my story, because I know there's a lot of people who've experienced similar things, if, if not the childhood stuff, maybe some of the adult stuff. Mm -hmm. um, they have, they've experienced similar feelings, um, but, but haven't been aware that there's others who can empathize with them and and share compassion so I feel like you know that's my job is to share this compassion and to help others have empathy um, and then and to help some of the people who are still suffering to see that they're not alone and maybe take more steps toward self-love and self-acceptance mm -hmm. and healing mm -hmm. from their own trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the way that I see it, um, we have 
really uh, an epidemic on our hands here, at least in the United States, uh, in terms of mental illness um, that has been exacerbated by the pandemic, you know. And um, I think a large part of the problem is p- people's will- uh, unwillingness to talk about it, you know, and that's why I think people like you are so important, you know, to, um, to share your story, to put it in writing the way that you did. And, you know, it takes a lot of courage, you know, like to write the things about your dad and your dad is still alive and, you know, your uncle and your whole family. And I'm sure there were some people that were pretty pissed off about some of the things that you wrote. Maybe, I don't know if that's true or not. Was there any backlash by any people in your life? You know, I was really shocked at how supportive all of my birth family have been Mm -hmm. other than, you know, I haven't talked to my father about it. Um, Mm -hmm. I have no idea how he'd respond. Yeah. But, you know, I really expected a lot of my family members to, you know, chastise me for airing the dirty laundry. And, um, you know, there's there's just a lot of different ways that that people can feel hurt or betrayed. Sure. Someone telling their story, even if it's 100 percent true and accurate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've been really fortunate as far as that goes. I think um, there's probably people who, when I talk about some of the events of my adult life, um, I doubt that the people who are aware of the, the book and who were part of those stories, I don't think that they're um, as understanding or interested in the value of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but I haven't had those conversations. So Oddly enough, um, the only people who've expressed anger, I've had, there's been a couple of readers who've, um, readers. Made, yeah, who've made comments about, um, you know, me making poor decisions in my oh. adult life and how, how infuri- infuriating that was to read. Hmm. Um, because I think they, they didn't quite understand that that was part of the point was how, Right. How cruel the person can come into young adulthood mm. as. Um, so that was really surprising, you know, to to have those kinds of comments. But um, but really, the support of my family has been incredibly surprising and, mm. and very welcomed, of course. So that, that's a good segue. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and read the second um excerpt that we have, which is more, it's, it starts out for my 19th birthday, right? So we're going to fast forward into Bobby's young adult years here. And, but I want to pick up on that discussion where, um, you talked about people being upset with you making bad decisions, right? Like I find that to be fascinating and like, I can understand why they would say that having read the book, like I, I can understand that, but for me, it like, (laughs) How, the the fact that this individual is still alive, you know, after what she went through is nothing short of a miracle. And then for her to make some bad decisions in life is to be expected. I mean, how could you not, you know, it's all about foundational issues, you know, and, and to not have those in place, how, how that's what is so mind blowing to me is that you are where you are, you know, and I, I want to get into that in a little bit, but let me go ahead and read this second excerpt. You, you're going to sit back and listen to it. Hopefully, uh, it uh, stirs up the, the same emotions again, and, and we'll, we'll take it from there. So here we go. For my 19th birthday, my father came to visit me in my apartment, which I subleased from another girl for the summer. James was living in Lexington again, and I had my own place for the first time. I was once more working for the college that sum- working, that, uh, working for the college that summer and was surprised to find I could pay my bills and did so on time. My meth dealer, a chemistry major at the college, had moved away after dropping out of school again. My apartment was on top, was on the top floor of an old house, and I loved to climb out the living room window onto the roof of the second story. I would sit there and smoke cigarettes, always natural or organic tobacco, because I was still trying to be healthy. (laughs) I watched the sunset from there and listened to the train. In some ways, I was at peace. Soon after he arrived, my father crushed a lore tab and Ritalin and mixed them together and offered me a rolled up dollar bill to snort a couple of lines with. I wondered how I could accept such a gift. It was expensive. I knew the pills cost more than anyone could truly afford. 
The pharmaceutical companies have not only made billions of dollars every year since they hit the Appalachian jackpot, they have also a growing list of families and children and souls in their profit column. I know that people who want to escape will find a way to get high, get drunk or whatever else. And the Eli Lilly didn't put my father, pull my father from a path of righteousness. But you have to wonder how much was being done to guard against abuse when the only things at stake were these hicks and hillbillies, these rednecks and backwood inbreeders. Balance that against the stock prices, the yachts and cruises, the Cuban cigars, and our history shows that time and time again, poor people just can't compete. I've watched my generation turn into people like my father, in and out of jail, their children being raised by grandparents, their babies going to foster care. As the taste for painkillers has spread from the poor to the middle class, a collective agony has been uncovered. The poor used to be hidden so well, and now it seems that everywhere I go in my small town or in the larger town I commute to, and on the interstate in between, there is someone carrying everything they own in a garbage bag, wearing clothes that don't fit. I spent years wanting to escape my own body to get some relief from the inner hell that would never just let me be. Now I look into my father's vacant eyes, hear the slur in his voice, and I know he found a way out of whatever hell he was keeping him company. I see it all around me in the sunken, wild eyes I avoid in the grocery store. I see it in the way many addicts walk, a certain looseness, looseness I've come to recognize in the lost. It's so easy to escape the sinister harvest we now face after decades upon decades of exploitation and its attendant social ills. Poor health, broken schools, broken homes. But the escape only lasts for a few hours at a time. I took the rolled up dollar bill from my father and snorted the burning powder, telling myself I could not reject what I thought was the only way he could show me love. It would be a long time before I felt like I deserved the love that didn't hurt. So you move on from your early life of watching this. And from my perspective of reading it, you kind of moved into it, right? At least the substance use portion of it right? There was a lot of substance use going on inside the household that you grew up in. And now you're in it, you know, you're, you're doing math, you're snorting lines with your dad, you know, in that one particular instance. Um, you know, and if you read the book, like, you know, you were in pretty deep, you were in deep, you know, um, from a, from a guy who's, you know, been to college and seen a lot of people using drugs and doing sort of different things like reading your perspective, you were a heavy drug user at one point in time. Um, so, so yeah, you made some poor decisions, but how could you not? Right. That's how I look at it. I mean, how could you not? Um, but one thing that has struck me that, and, and I didn't want this discussion to end without us talking about this. And I love how you say this is, you know, you own it, you own what you've done in your past. You're not afraid of it. You're embracing it. You've put it out there for everybody to learn from and you own it. And I, I just, I love that. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it feels to me like I was just such, I feel like I'm in a different life, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I mm -hmm. pretty much inhabit yeah. a different world now. Mm -hmm. So to look back on, 19 year old me or 18 year old me and be like oh she she did meth for a year it's just almost hard to comprehend even right. for myself because but I know at the time I mean I started you know I was exposed like I was given weed when I was 14 I was always given alcohol as a child um you know pills and just all the stuff was kind of ever increasingly available. And I just ate it up. I mean, I was, I was desperate to hmm. feel something other than what I felt inside because what I felt inside, you know, I refer to it as this hell inside me um, in the book. And I'm not sure that people who haven't had those experiences of, of like, you know, maybe, maybe it's complex PTSD, maybe it's 
some other effect of trauma. Um, but the amount of, of guilt and shame and pain and fear that I've walked around with constantly um, just felt like it was eating me from the inside. And so anything I could do to get a break from that, I wanted, you know, and that's, that's why when my, well, so, you know, when, when my meth dealer, for instance, moved away, I didn't seek meth. I didn't particularly care that it was yeah. gone. Um, because what I wanted was to feel good. Right. And so I found other ways to try to feel good. And at the same time that I was doing all the, you know, this very self-destructive drug, mm. use, I was also a vegan and I went hiking yeah. and yeah. I, I meditated mm -hmm. and I tried to raise my consciousness yeah. because, you know, I also knew that that would make me feel good or feel better. Uh, it's, it's still just kind of wild to think about like these two competing paths, you know, mm -hmm. and I was in college. I loved school. Um, you know, I loved doing my homework. I loved talking to my professors and being in class. And yet it was like, I was probably so close to killing myself without right. meaning to, because I was so desperate to get a sense of relief. Um, so I was constantly looking for these shortcuts, which don't work as we all know. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel, you know, I'm really fortunate. And I, I knew that when I wrote about my young adult life and some of the choices that I made that you know, I was, I was including things in the book that I could have very easily left out. I could have gone from being a victimized child to being kind of a heroic self-made person who, you know, chooses a different life, um, embrace the best of Appalachia and the best of my family and, and, you know, yet take this very different path. I could have left out the ugly stuff, right. um, but I chose to leave it in because, or I chose to put it in because I felt like there's still people out there making these self-destructive choices. Uh -huh. there's, there's still a lot of desperate people out there. And if I showed them the childhood hell and then the happy ending adult life, then that really wouldn't give them any any map to be able to see themselves as adults reading my story. You know, they would still mm -hmm. see themselves as the mm -hmm. failure mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. somehow didn't pull themselves up by their bootstraps and turn into some awesome person. Right. So I thought, I'm going to show myself failing. I'm going to show myself struggling because then some of the people who are struggling and failing will know that there's, there's a chance for something more for them too. Mm. But, like this is not your death sentence. It's not over until you're gone. And so, you know, we don't have to beat ourselves up and, and um, you know, it, of course we're a very judgmental society. I, I, it's hard to get away from it, but I thought if I can help some people stop judging themselves, like that can free people from the paralysis of shame, you know, like, mm -hmm. oh my God, look what I've done. Look what I've uh, failed to accomplish in my life. Um, those, those ideas can make it seem like, you know, life is over. There's nowhere else to go. So I put that stuff in because I thought that, that showing a, a shift from the, the young adult into uh, a healthy adult would be a source of hope for other adults who, you know, who are struggling. And yeah. really those are the people, you know, we need to help adults and we need to, to be doing a lot of intervention for children. Um, we kind of need to be taking, I think, a multifaceted approach with both of those sets of like, populations who are hurting mm, no doubt no doubt 
Um, so we have a few questions coming in that I want to just table. Um, but I do, I do want to get to, so we're, we're 30 minutes in here to a max 60 minute, um, presentation. I want to talk a little bit about Appalachia, Appalachia, as you say, as I guess they say in Appalachia. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about if you're comfortable with it, what you're doing now and like, you know, what you look forward to in life and kind of where the vision is for you as you go forward, because, you know, I really want to encourage anybody who's listening to this uh, to buy Bobby's book, right? Because we need to support people like her, number one. Number two, read it because it's so inspirational. And to be able to, I'm I, like, as a reader of your book, like, I just want to hear like, what's next for you and like what, what your life looks like now and where you're headed because there, that's not in the book, you know? So that, that's what's so fascinating for me is like, what's next for Bobby here? So, but before we go there, let's, let's just rattle off a few of these questions. I, I think this is a good one. Have you been able to forgive your father for things that happened in your childhood? I think so. Yeah. And forgiveness is one of those um, topics that I, I talk about uh, in the book, too. So, uh, you know, and I think, of course, the more time and, and wisdom that we gain, um, the more concepts like that can can become more clear and, you know, make more sense to just feel the truth of what they what it means to forgive someone. And now, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to be who I am. I'm grateful, you know, that I had an interesting experience and that I get to do something that feels meaningful, mm -hmm. which is, you know, to share my experience in, in a way that um, aims to help others. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I know that, or I believe that if, if my father or anyone who was abusive could could understand like the other kind of life that they you know that could have been available to them mm. like you know he really missed out he missed out on yeah just being able to enjoy his family and mm. being able to like feel how much I loved him and how mm. much we wanted to just right. you know enjoy life with him so I I, I feel some compassion for him. I do think it's important that we still hold people accountable. Um, so it's it's always an interesting question to figure out, like, you know, where does forgiveness and accountability, where do they meet? Mm. Um, so, but yeah, I, I do believe I've forgiven him. And, um, you know, I, I hope that he finds peace in his lifetime. Mm. Mm. Yeah, if you read Bobby's book, you'll understand how hard that could be. It, it's amazing to even hear the words, you know, because it, it was so traumatizing. So before I ask the next question, I have my my own question. We we did a, a little bit of a preparation meeting, you and the committee members from Team Up for Hope a few weeks ago. And one of the things that struck me was you still deal with trauma. Right. And it, it never really like dawned on me like, oh, yeah, right. Of course, like people who go through these traumatic situations are dealing with post-traumatic stress. Right? right. So talk a little bit about that. I mean, still to this day, I mean, again, there, there are so many things that we didn't talk about here tonight that were traumatizing in your life, in your adult life as well. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the most traumatizing thing that happened to you, we haven't even touched on, but We'll leave that for the readers in the book. Um, that's that's the cliffhanger there to get people to read your book. I'm always trying to sell Bobby. I'm a sales guy, so <laughs> <laughs> we 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 didn't unleash the the most um, sensational thing. But how do you deal with the trauma? What is it? What is it that you do? For me, um, you know, I've always felt like I was on a spiritual path, even as a child, and you know, then as a teenager. So. For me, like healing is um, is all about my spiritual well-being and um, my relationship with, you know, what I consider to be um, a higher power. So that is probably at the at the forefront of it. And 
And that is something that I did not have for a while mm. in teens and early adulthood. I certainly felt just really lost and unmoored. Um, so I've been grateful that I returned to a sense of, um, of being a spiritual being, having a spiritual path. Um, in a more concrete sense, right now, I work with a neurofeedback therapist. Um, I find her work really effective for dealing with just CPTSD. And she works with, um, you know, firefighters and police officers mm. and um, other people who regularly experience traumatic experiences in the line of duty, um, mm. but then also people who've dealt with a lot of abuse and what what's referred to as um, adverse childhood experiences. Um, so, you know, that is a big part of it for my current sort of external treatment is doing the neurofeedback therapy and starting, you know, probably when I was 30 and I, I talk about this point in the book, you know, when I had a realization one day that um, I didn't like my life and I was really unhappy and resentful and frustrated. And it hit me that I was the common denominator in all of the situations that I was mm -hmm. unhappy with. Mm -hmm. and that really shifted my thinking and made me go, oh gosh, I'm not going to be able to get away from this stuff. Right. Because it has something very fundamentally to do with me. And I didn't like that, but um, I, I started seeking like spiritual advice and uh, I worked with a life coach. And basically what I did was start to, you know, really examine my thought processes and my belief system and work on shifting those. And, you know, it, it might sound really simple, but of course, if you're if you're traumatized, you're probably walking around with beliefs that the world is a hostile place. Um, I was certainly walking around believing that I didn't deserve certain things, like most good things. Um, and, and so my tolerance for uh, poor treatment was really high. My ability to read danger was also very low. Mm. Um, because I was around so much danger. So much of it, yeah. Yeah. Just kind of taking it for granted, like this is normal. Yeah. Right. So if it didn't rise to a very high level of danger, I didn't see it. You know, I was mm. just like, oh, okay. Which probably explains a lot of the too. I was like, oh, yeah, this is okay. This isn't being dragged down the road by my hair. So I'm fine. Right, okay. right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, I think there's a lot of different paths to get there, um, to heal trauma. And we're very fortunate to have like, you know, different modalities by psychotherapists, um, who, who can help people just immensely in ways that we couldn't, you know, maybe even a decade ago. Right. Um, and I've, I've come to accept too, that you know, I, I just realized as I was working on this book um, last year as it was about to come out, I realized I am not going to end up being a person with a clean slate who, you know, isn't shaped by trauma, but I can be someone who isn't reacting to trauma or mm -hmm. acting from a traumatized place within myself. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to someday feel like someone who wasn't traumatized at all, but instead I'm going to have this kind of richness of experience, um, but also the, the freedom that comes with, you know, not being controlled by pain and fear. Mm. Yeah. It's an important thing to not live in fear. It's crippling to live in fear, you know? It is. It really yeah. is. Okay. So we're at 739. I've got 21 minutes left and there's a lot of good questions here and there's still some good content that I want to try to get to. So let me ask two more of the questions that have come in here. Um, 
Yeah, Let, let's do two more and then we'll move on. If we have more time, we can come back to some others because there are there are a bunch of good ones. So if here here's, I think, a good one. If you could tell your younger self anything, what would it be? The first thing that comes to mind is that I would tell myself, like, things are going to get better. That was what gave me hope when I was struggling was the idea that you know that could be true um but I, I, it was really something I held on to out of maybe stubbornness more mm. than rather than having any evidence that it was true and so yeah if I could go back to my younger self I would reassure her it does get better mm. it can get better so you just keep keep working at it hang in there don't give yeah. up there's a, yeah. there's always hope you know there is always hope okay um this is kind of a funny one but a good a good question um from a gentleman who's watching us facebook live has anyone approached you about a movie deal um my agent has the rights you know uh, to to the movie to to do a movie if someone were to purchase them um but no as far as i know that has not been like something that they've been approached by or right. for. So well, I think the answer is we need to get more people to buy your book and raise some, you know, more awareness about it. And then the movie deal will follow. There's no question about it. I think that would be great um, because, you know, the movie would reach a lot of people that right. aren't going to pick up Read. the book. Yeah. And, um, and there's just more opportunity for it to reach people who might need it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, to summarize the whole thing, it, it is such a story of hope. You know, that's really what it is. It's just like you said, you know, you're telling your younger self, just hang in there. Better days are ahead. Don't give up hope. You know, it's, it's still there. So good. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, transition into a broader discussion about Appalachia, because I want I want to talk about the region. I don't, I don't want everybody who's here in 18 minutes. So maybe let's do 10 minutes on Appalachia, and then maybe we'll end with kind of where are you now? What are you doing? You know, all those good things. Okay. So I want to read um, one more excerpt here, and then we'll show the map that you and I were talking about, so people can understand geographically where we're talking about. Okay. This is a shorter read, so here we go. Life was different in our holler, I came to learn. And we were definitely living in a holler, not a hollow like you might read about in the dictionary or see on a fancy map. Merriam Webster's will tell you it's a very small valley or basin. The dictionary can also tell you it's a depressed, it's a depressed or low part of a surface, an unfilled space. But what it can't tell you is what that means where the depression becomes visible in the land what is inhabiting all of that unfilled space. Only people who are raised in hollers can do that. A holler is a place where you very likely grow up in spitting distance of a relative or at least close enough to see their house when the leaves have fallen for the year. It's a place where the sun takes a little longer to show itself in the morning and falls to sleep behind the hills a little sooner. Someone's always discovering the treasures buried in hollers, lumber, mineral, light, mineral rights, gas rights, and when they're not ravaging the forest, we explored as children, unsupervised and unafraid or muddling the clear streams. We, we were splashed and found fossils and learned to pick up crawdads without getting pinched. When they're not ravaging our minds with oxyco oxycontin and cheap heroin and low paying jobs in Mountain Dew and broken schools. It is us doing the ravaging, pulling our guns out or throwing fists, taking a beating in front of the kids or searching desperately through dad's dresser while he's gone knowing there's something in there that will get us high. So I, I find, you know, that, that excerpt to me is, is really striking, right? Because again, here you're, you're owning some of it, right? It's like, yes, these things are being done to us, but we're also doing it to ourselves and, you know, um, carrying on this uh, cycle of brokenness within this region. Um, so I just wanted a quick, um, before we get into Appalachia, um, let's just, show the the map here so this is a map that bobby and i settled on which is a good one and the idea here is this yellow is kind of ground zero of appalachia and and where is this set 
Bobby? Like where on here is, is the book set? So um, it's basically up just a little from where your cursor is. In yeah. This area here? Okay. Yeah, not the oh. not the northernmost, but kind of in the middle there. Right over yeah. here. Okay. Yeah. So it, and so you literally grew up in the heart of the Appalachia uh, territory. And it extends, you know, like when I think of Appalachia, I think, you know, West Virginia, Kentucky, right? Like mm -hmm. those are, and that is kind of like the heart of it. But Look at how much it goes into North Carolina and South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and all the way up through Pennsylvania. You know, there's just outer extensions of it. So how is the region? Is it is it progressing? Are things getting better? Things getting worse? Or they just haven't changed much in, let's say, a 30 to 40 year run? You know, I, I think like a lot of things... There's, there's progress in some ways, and then there's, um, you see some of the same cycles playing out in other ways. I mean, and, and I believe a lot of people from Appalachia wouldn't want to focus on the negatives, right? Because Appalachia has been the brunt of so many stereotypes and mm -hmm. so much dismissal. Mm -hmm. um, like the rest of the country has largely overlooked the good that has come out of Appalachia or the good that is occurring in Appalachia for a very long time. Mm. And that there is a lot of good, you know, there is a lot of, there's a lot of beauty. There's a lot of um, great accomplishments. There's a lot of social good that occurs and, and personal good. Um, and then there, there are still cycles of poverty. There's still problems with, you know, uh, access to healthcare, mm -hmm. um, poor educational outcomes, um, the, the healthcare indicators in Appalachia are all very low and historically have been. There's a high rate of disability and illness mm -hmm. in the region. So, you know, uh, like, like most Appalachians, I love Appalachia and uh, don't want to portray it as a place where people are just continuing to do the same thing and you know, kind of harming themselves over and over. But people aren't stuck in cycles. You know, we don't have generational trauma or generational poverty because anybody likes it, right? Mm -hmm. It's because institutional problems are very, they're very difficult to fix on an individual level. So you get success stories like mine, um, but that doesn't mean that you have sort of the, the broader institutional change in a, a whole region. And I think that's because a lot of the same issues that kind of laid the foundation for Appalachia's problems, you know, some of those issues haven't been fixed or they haven't been, um, the right interventions haven't mm. occurred. It's, you know, I would say largely just a matter of, of resources. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So the takeaway for me, as I'm listening to you talk about that is that there is hope in the region. Um, there is, there are things being done. It seems like there are more services for people to get through what they're going through than there may have been in the past, right? Just in your own case, you've experienced that. Oh, yeah. um, so it seems like maybe things are progressing, but obviously there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if I, I of course don't know what all the answers are. I have sure. some ideas. Um, <laughs> But you know, there's there's progress being made. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of focus on celebrating the good that is in Appalachia, and I really I hope to help um, inspire conversations about like how do we foster and nurture the good and preserve the the aspects of the culture that are you know, authentic and, sure. and good mm -hmm. without, well, and at the same time, 
kind of address some of the the social ills like the financial issues that have plagued the region for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, that's that's a broader conversation and a deeper conversation. Mm -hmm. And one what organizations are doing good work in the area? What organizations that I might know about that I might not know? What are they doing? Like, what are some good ones that you're dialed into? Um, gosh, I'm going to blank on the name now, but there is there's um, oh, it's Green Forests Work. Um, that's an organization. Do? It's an I'm sorry. What do they do? So they are working on reforesting like um, mines, strip mines, mm -hmm. right? Because strip mining has devastated the ecology of mm -hmm. Appalachia mm -hmm. um, a lot in eastern Kentucky. And um, it's really hard to remedy that. You know, and that contributes to a lot of like continuing environmental degradation that causes mm -hmm. a lot of financial hardship. And um, I'm sure the, there's a lot of links to the health problems in those areas as well. Some of those places like Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. um, you know, they also don't have clean drinking water because it's been ruined by the mining operations, mm -hmm. which is long ago you know, packed up and left uh -huh. uh, without in, investing money in the community and historically without paying taxes into the communities as well. Uh -huh. So um, so green forests work. Um, they're going through and using proven methods to restore the ecosystem, um, which brings back, you know, both flora and fauna. Uh -huh. And um, I think their work is one of the creative and really exciting solutions that um, deserves a lot more recognition. Mm, um, that's great. Yeah. So that's the one that I've, you know, talked to and hoping to do some writing uh, about their projects and go see some of them in person at some point. That's great. That's great. Okay. Um, so let's talk about where, what you're doing. Um, are you still, are you a professor? No, I, um, so I taught as an adjunct for a few years okay. at Eastern Kentucky University and at a community college um, that's based out of Lexington in mm -hmm. Kentucky. But, um, you know, adjunct uh, teaching doesn't pay the bills. So yeah. <laughs> um, I worked as a technical writer for a few years okay. and um you know, worked on my book and I'm actually working for a marketing department right now. Right. Um, am I not You're working on a new book, right? I am. Yeah. We're wrapping up the last of the um, little cool. edits and it's a novel. It's historical fiction meets um, magical realism, which I think mm -hmm. is, I'm, I'm sure from reading my memoir, you could probably tell that I... I'm enamored with the sense of magical realism that um, mm. I think pervades the Appalachian region naturally. Mm, mm. So I really tried to bring that to life in this novel and explore um, a fictional version of my great grandparents' lives. Um, and then it's also, there's other generational stories in that novel. Well, uh, Susan, says please keep writing you have an amazing gift and i can't wait to read your new novels so and i agree with that i think that again you you have got to keep keep going to keep telling your story because it is such an amazing story and you you, you know you think of all the people out there that have suffered um similar fates right um in terms of the childhood and the young adulthood but have never made it out the other end or don't have the wherewithal to communicate the way that you do, you know? So that's why I say, you know, I said at the beginning, you're really a hero. You know, you're a, you're a, you're a gem because you've been through it. You've come through it and you live to tell the story and have an amazing ability to tell that story. So that's why I just, I wanted to be able to interview you here and just get, get your, your name and your book out there to more and more people, because I just think it's so important. I wish you nothing but 
the, you know, the, the best of luck and success and everything that you're doing, because people like you need to have a spotlight on you. You know, you really do. Um, it's been remarkable. And I hope uh, everybody here buys your book. Um, Thank you. That's, that's really kind of you. All of everything you said is just very kind and generous. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's the least I can do and any of us can do here at team up for hope for you. So, all right, I'm going to kind of wrap things up here. We're down to five minutes left. Uh, we'll close it out before then, but I wanted to, um, just show everybody what the image on Amazon looks like. Uh, so when you go to buy Bobby's book and I expect every one of you who's watching this or heard anything about Bobby, to buy her book. It's going to help her, right? We want her to keep talking and sharing the words. So what helps is you buy her book, right? Makes her more popular. She goes up in ratings and so on and so forth. So here it is right here in the shadow of the valley. And um, I'm a Kindle guy. So I always get the stuff on the Kindle and it was great. It was well formatted. It did all the moves that you need to do. So they did a nice job on that. And I understand you told me, I think that you did the audio yourself, right? I did. Yeah. Um, I recorded the audio book. Um, you know, it's, it's my publisher, of course, did the, the recording, the engineering and all that. So mm -hmm. um, it was a very interesting experience. I didn't think about the, the emotional and psychological impact of narrating it for the world. Um, but I'm really glad I got to. And, uh, you know, it was just one more great aspect of this experience of of like owning my story and working on my relationship with the story deepening mm -hmm. it great great and we just got a chat message in that there's a gentleman by the name of andrew matthews on facebook and we'll be able to connect you with him he said he's a filmmaker and he's interested in talking more with you so who knows i don't know anything about mr matthews but <laughs> hopefully it could lead to something big for you because your story needs to be told um, okay. I would like to let you know that, um, I and team up for hope would like to donate some money to an organization of your choice. Um, so you'll have to follow up with me on what that is, what organization that is, whether it's, um, green forest work or some other organization. I know that you had, you know, done some work in the prison system, uh, with artwork. So you have a lot of different angles that you'd like to do, but we'd like to make a donation. It's not going to be thousands of dollars, but it'll be hundreds of dollars, you know? Um, so we'd like to do that for you and appreciation for showing up here tonight. Thank and you. then um, the last thing that I'd like to do is of course, acknowledge uh, all of our sponsors for team up for hope, because we really couldn't do everything that we want to, and it wouldn't be as meaningful without being able to donate money to people like Bobby Kahn and, and the organizations that she wants us to donate to. So here's a look at the uh, businesses that are, um, you know, quintessential to uh, Team Up for Hope. And you can always check out our organization at teamupforhope.org and learn more about us. We are primarily uh, in the, the northern uh, suburbs of New York City, and we support a lot of local organizations there. But we're a little bit outside of our scope talking to Bobby here tonight, but I had to do it because it was just such a good book and she accepted my opportunity to talk with her and I hope everybody enjoyed it. So Bobby, I'll let you have the final word. Well, I just really appreciate this. Um, thank you so much for putting it together and for reaching out. Um, I'm glad that you have this interest in Appalachia and that that led you to my book and yeah, everybody who attended and, you know, all of your kind comments, I've read them all. And, uh, you know, just really grateful to be in this moment with all of you. Great. Well, thanks so much. I hope that this is the beginning of a relationship with Team Up for Hope and Bobby Kahn, and, and we can continue to stay in touch for years to come. And maybe we do a follow up after one of your next books that you write, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll keep it going. That'd be great. Thank All right. You. Sounds great. Bobby, thanks so much. And thank you, everybody who followed along with us here and, and hopefully enjoyed our time. Take care.